So first of all, um, we'll get started straight away. So uh, basically the structure of this interview, I'm going to ask you questions uh, about you and we're going to talk about um, a bit about Cardiff and Cardiff University, uh, the education the research, and then we're going to move on to more general questions. So basically about the political, uh, what's going on in the political world and um, then we're going to end up more uh, questions uh, about you, about your point of view. So we'll get started straight away. So first of all, uh, how long did you uh, study at Cardiff University? So I started in September 2011 and finished in July 2015, so four years pretty much. Okay, and are you yourself intrigued with EU politics? Sorry, just going only sorry, bad signal. What was that again? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, are you uh, interested uh, with European politics? Oh yeah, oh, oh, yeah, oh, almost definitely yes. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. So are you pretty much up to date with the EU referendum and the issues that have been discussed lately? Yes. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. So um, just to give you a bit of um, information, uh, Wales at the moment is benefit uh, benefiting. Uh, from around two billion pounds of EU investments into the Welsh economy each year. And from what we know, that money is used to fund uh, the four main baskets. So we have regional development where research and education are very much included. Then there is agriculture, uh, maritime and social, where we have um, the tackling of poverty and uh, providing opportunities for jobs and skills. And my next question is, I want to get your uh, point of view on this. Uh, how does Cardiff University benefit from the EU funds in terms of supporting the education and the research? So you ask, you're asking that with, with regards to the EU, did you say? Yes. Well, if I take um, Cardiff, if I take the physics department as an example. Yes. Um, we benefit quite a bit from collaborations that are made a lot easier via being part of the union. Um, we benefit from various equipment being born with like um, with money from the EU part, but also critically, um, science departments in especially Cardiff University, but many other universities across the, even the country um, uh, have like quite a big stake in the grants that um, the, the financial grants that we win as part of the EU. So the UK, out of like all countries in general in the European Union, are the second they're the second best at getting that grant money for, the, for for research out of all the countries in the uh, European Union. So Cardiff benefits from this um, immensely, especially with the physics department. I think roughly about half the funding that we've had recently has come from EU grants that we've won um, over over the past couple of years. So. That's like kind of like it's sort of a contextual uh, reason, like perhaps why Cardiff University benefits from EU funding, but generally most, if not all, departments benefit from that because they get to, they, we pay in, but we also get to win out in grants as well. And it usually net benefits the UK by quite a considerable margin, especially in Wales. I see. Considering the funding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, since uh, we have been provided uh, the date for the referendum, which is to take it place is. on the 23rd of June, if the British public vote to leave and the EU funds may well be, be cut, uh, will there be uh, terrible consequences on the education and research sectors in Cardiff? Um, I would say yes, because a lot of the sort of Brexit arguments you hear generally rely on this idea that we have this set pot of money afterwards. They usually draw or, you know, a lot of the arguments tend to draw on where we don't have to pay into the EU, so we'll have the money to then spread to the regions that need the most in the UK and what have you. But, like, because of the uncertainty of that, that's quite like an arbitrary statement to make to begin with. When we take science or education, for example, Cardiff University, the money that we get from the EU, and suddenly we now we don't get, universities will start having a plan going, where's the money coming from? That's not a guarantee to be given by a government regardless of who it is, whether Conservative, Labour, Green, UKIP, whoever was in power, it's not guaranteed that these people are going to get these set pots of money. So you create this panic and you then have to convince governments that like this particular grant is worth, you know, the money, sorry, this particular grant proposal is worth the money given to it. Um, I think the uncertainty will therefore lead to funding disparities. 
and also the funding, the loss of funding that makes up for things. So if I use this as a general example, uh, rather than say just Cardiff, uh, a lot of the funding for science in the UK have recently, like there's been quite big news about the fact that in real terms, we're losing uh, our, like um, as a percentage of GDP, our funding for science and innovation, for science technology. Um, that's actually being made up um, quite a bit by EU grants that we win. So if you take away those EU grants, the government have to address the idea now there's even less money in the pot for science technology, which the UK has been a world leader in. And it's embarrassing as a scientist to see that out of all the G7 countries, um, uh, the UK funds as a percentage of GDP lower than the average in the G7, which historically and what we have here in general it's quite embarrassing because we have the capability of doing world, world quality research as we still as we do, but that's under threat if we start getting less and less funding. It's as simple as that. I see. Well, uh, well, uh, my next question is: Well, at the moment uh, there are around twenty four thousand students studying in Cardiff, and a large number of those are originally from an EU background or a country who come to Cardiff to seek a better future for themselves, building their skills and finding jobs in UK to become uh, professionals and obviously contribute towards the local economy and pay their taxes. So coming back to the referendum, if the UK obviously decides to go, what will happen to the students uh, from your point of view? Well, it, it, I guess it's a bit of a multifaceted question because say we leave, you know, say obviously the referendum ends up for Brexit, there's that time of delay that it costs that, you know, to, to, to once, once we leave on that date, we don't actually leave on that date, it'll take many years to actually unravel the legal issues because you have to redesign laws to not accommodate for the European Union, you know, being part of it, I should say. So there's a bit of, there's a, bit of a delay time, but what happens during that delay time? I think is a lot of panic and uncertainty from say these individuals yeah. and also just the feeling of just feeling unwelcome. So now you'd have a country that sort of, well, you know, if we take tuition fees, for example, EU students would probably be expected to pay international fees. Now international fees is a, a huge amount of money for, you know, say if an American wants to study in Cardiff University, you know, know many Americans who studied during while well, I was here who like, you know, paying in excess of 60 to $70,000 you know, and that's quite a lot of money, you know, as anyone could probably understand. It's now probably equivalent to what people starting after 2012, 13, after 2012 are now paying with uh, Sterling. But I think what happens is that we lose these people overall because this could leave it. This could be left open for home countries in the EU to uh, start um, incent being incentivized. So what I mean by that is that if now people are spending even more money to just come to the UK, what stops countries in the EU saying, well, we can provide you this education for a fraction of the cost, and when their universities now have an opportunity to grow into this market of people not wanting to pay all that money to come into the UK, we have that issue of people that once you're, once you're not part of the European Union and you you know they come in and they study, being told that they have to leave as soon as they've got their degree. We're losing countless amount of professionals on that. We're seeing this now, um, in essence, with like the Conservative government and the uh, rules that Theresa May has like put forward by saying people need to leave after a certain amount of time after their degrees, which means that you lose, you get a brain drain, so effectively, in a sense of, of the potential of what you had. You want to keep these people here, especially Wales, where they want to like, where we want to sort of like increase our sort of just capacity of education and just therefore our capacity of like the economy. It's a crucial, crucial for Wales that we retain the people that come in. And I think with the harms I've sort of given here, you might not see that. You might see countries or air regions basically like Wales suffering. And, and that happens in places in England, Scotland especially, and Northern Ireland even more so, considering its size and its economic output. I see, yeah. OK, uh, moving on now to a political question. Um, so, so far, from what, we're, what we've been following from the BBC or ITV News, uh, has David Cameron so far achieved all his necessary goals for the renegotiation uh, with the EU, or does he still have a very long way to go? 
it's how, how you frame this question, I think, sometimes is important with his uh, recent sort of dealings. Recently, he's come away and said, I've got these reforms. Um, there's, there's quite a few, you know, quite a few that basically does give us even more sort of a privileged uh, status in the EU, something that people in the EU or the, the powers that be in the EU as well as us have said, right, we're willing to do this to keep you in, right? This is as, this is as far as they'll pretty much go. Now, the problem is when he comes to like a domestic issue, when he comes back to us and says, right, I've done this. I don't think no matter what he does will actually convince a lot of the people who are campaigning for out. So I don't think the momentum is lost, say, from the Brexit side when he comes back and says he gets all the reforms he wants or none of the reforms he wants or a bit of the reform he wants. He obviously wanted more with the reforms that he did get, but um, that's seen all across the tabloids. But what becomes crucial is even if he achieved all that he did, people who want to leave want total control of the borders, they don't want freedom of movement, they don't want these things that he can't negotiate out of if he wants to be part of the EU. So he's never going to win over that many people from the the like the Brexit crowd, I don't think, regardless of what he gets. Yeah. If I understand the question correctly, I think it's kind of more of a, was it effective in the conversation? I don't think it is personally, because people have already picked their sides before he did the, ref uh, the reforms. Yeah. Very, very marginal gains for him. Yeah, especially, I mean, uh, quite recently, um, majority of his cabinet are all in favour of the, the Brexit uh, to leave that, really, especially with in Duncan Smith. And now Boris Johnson, who recently voiced his own uh, view of leaving the EU altogether, really. Yeah, yeah. I think there is that kind of um, the angle that some people um, follow with the idea that this is all kind of just petty internal um, conservative politics being sort of overblown into a giant referendum that's a risk in itself. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure how I feel about that kind of idea, but I do see, I mean, the split in the Conservative Party is seen, but and people are picking sides, but it, it's it's become, it, as time develops, I think we might hear more like vocal opinions from Boris Johnson, but at the moment, I think it's still, still even in the early days to see how deep that division becomes. Yeah. I, 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 if, 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 for example, we left, like I think that Boris Johnson basically is the big winner out of it, if you consider that. Like, if, he, if, if, if we left, I think David Cameron would be in a very awkward position and might even step down very soon after because he kind of lost a bit of a political bargaining chip or he, he kind of lost the political game there, which means that people on the Brexit side are more open. And to be honest, the only person on the Brexit side at the moment that would have any conceivable chance of being a leader or being accepted by the public or being accepted by even the party, probably Boris Johnson, which, you know, opens up a different question entirely. But um I think it's too early to tell only because some of the, the, the political gears for the referendum hasn't gotten to massive full swing yet. It's just only started, which is kind of a it's kind of a good thing for like I guess people on the side to be you know give some time to get their popcorn so to speak. I don't think we've seen uh, the heated arguments yet, but we've, we're starting to see them pop up. Yes, I suppose. Uh, yeah. Uh, my next question, uh, which you sort of already answered, but um, so what do you hope? will happen in the next three months from now until June? What do I hope? Um, yeah. What I yeah, what I hope and what I think will happen, I think, are two completely separate things, unfortunately. I, as a sign, well, you know, pr prospective scientist, um, would love the fact that in the, in the media we'd have a conversation about the damage leaving the European Union would do on, scientific, on science in general within the UK or at least have the discussion and debate about that. But I feel that, admittedly, this is kind of marginal to most of the people who are going to vote because they don't see the importance of it. That's not, that's not a slight on them because it's quite hard to sometimes to describe to the public how all these mechanisms work. What I fear the conversation will be will be on this argument about immigration and this argument about sovereignty, where I feel it becomes just a political sort of just just a muddy fight of people just sort of proclaiming let's make Britain great again sort of like you know th that kind of basic debate where we're just sort of talking about you know from small things about nationalism to very very damaging things which you can count national probably one of them but 
very damaging things about what people say about immigration in general. You know, you don't, you don't necessarily get a logical conversation, unfortunately, with a lot of like the media. You get quite a lot of xenophobia, generally racism. It, you just get a lot of unpleasant things that just you don't get. You don't get a debate, and that's what I'm worried about with the next three months. We can, we can, I can, I can sit here as a scientist going, oh. You know, it seems like a dumb deal that we should stay in the EU because science. But if I can't make that argument to, you know, the local postman or the local taxi driver or the, the you know the local factory worker or the, or the local you know uh, test person working in Tesco's, then we're not really having a discussion where we're talking on equal platforms. Yes. We're not making people need for the, on the pro EU side, there needs to be a broad sort of conversation about all aspects. If people, you know, if people, you know, but that's kind of an obvious statement as well. The frustration is that it's how you have a good conversation where everyone feels welcome and you can discuss things and iron them out. But when it becomes so politically charged as an immigration or, you know, talking about anything else, of course, becomes a new thing. I think it'll get, it'll get focused on that and about freedom of movement. And I worry for the com I worry for the topic for the conversation, I guess, for my side being the pro-EU side. Yeah. Well, in terms of um, uh, giving people the opportunity to debate, uh, this is more of a, um, a quiz question for you. Um, are you aware in mainland Europe, so in, for example, in France, in Germany, in Spain as well, in Belgium, there are around about two million uh, British citizens living in mainland Europe. And for me, I mean, uh, I come from and was brought up in Belgium and I was able to to experience the whole um, European uh, community from that side. And in Belgium, uh, there are about, at the moment, 30,000 Brits living there, not just um, MEPs, but yeah, businessmen, families, yeah. Uh, people who, who decided to return to spend their lives there. And none of them uh, can vote in this referendum and they're not being given a right to voice uh, their views. Uh, do you think they should be uh, legally allowed to vote or be excluded? It's, it's, it's a tricky one, I suppose. I mean, because um, places such as Gibraltar have been given the vote, if I if I remember correctly. Yes. Because of just like the idea of like kind of regions that the UK, you know, have a you know have a dependency relationship with. Um, but yeah, when we talk about, say, like, I know, like, prime example, I guess, of that would be Spain, because I think the vast majority of, you know, migration of British citizens has gone to Spain in Europe, I believe. I might be wrong, but um, That's I right. probably would. Yeah. It's difficult. Um, I must admit, I haven't really thought about the, that issue, but I would, I would feel that they should have some form of platform, at the very least. Ideally, you'd say, well, give them the vote. To me, I, I would. If you compare the numbers of like, if you compare the numbers of migration that comes to mainland Europe and the people who can actually vote, it's not like you're giving an unfair bias, really. But I think the reason why they said, I think that was the reason why they initially said, we don't want the expats voting, which is basically a nice term for migration, which is given to people who live in the UK but not people who come here. But um, um. I think it was given because it'd be an unfair advantage, but I'm just a bit like, it's it's very difficult. I see the problem, but I I would be edging towards giving them a vote. But then again, I would be saying that perhaps because I'm pro EU, and they're undoubtedly going to be pro EU because if you left if you left the European Union, what happens to them? Some people might be able to stay. Some people some people will definitely have to move back. So it becomes an interesting thing. Perhaps it's because it's a voting block they would assume would definitely just say yes, regardless. But there's voting blocks in the UK that would definitely say no. As in, they don't want to leave, they don't want to stay. You know, it, it's difficult, difficult. I wouldn't want to be in charge of that conversation, I suppose, <laughs> in the electoral commission, I have to admit. Yeah, because, of course, if they do decide to leave, uh, what will happen to them? And would how they're going to be accommodated uh, jobs and where to live because some of those people decided to make uh, their permanent living um, abroad. So if they either will be forced to change their, um, their citizenship, which majority of them uh, don't want to, but if they're forced under uh, the new regulations, they will 
might have to really, uh, which is going to be very difficult and strenuous on them. And uh, yes, and my next question is, will you personally be voting uh, for this referendum? Yes, almost definitely. Well, not almost definitely, definitely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's very <Yeah>. good to know. <laughs> yeah. That's definite. Um, yeah, without showing a doubt. And yes, uh, my last final question, uh, just to, to wrap this all up. Um, do you strongly encourage other young voters, those between the age of 18 to 25, not just in Cardiff, but throughout the UK, yeah. to vote for this? I, I, yeah, I, I think this is like a very, very important question to answer. I mean, one of the things that I view as someone who wants to stay in the European Union um, if you know, if I'm, obviously I can say that, as I've said a couple of times, probably you can guess my views. Um, one thing that like I definitely realise is that the vast majority of people who want to leave are from the older generation, probably because they were alive during when the initial formation of the common market and have now seen the European Union develop as as an idea. One thing that I see as the problem, that could be a massive problem for the pro-EU side, is that the majority of people who want to stay in generally are the younger generation. Hmm. Now, people in my age group, unfortunately, do not turn up for elections in the, in the same percentage as the older generation. So I think in the last general election, um, I think it was about 46% of 18 to 24-year-olds um, turn up for the general election, roughly about that amount and compare that to about 70% of the 65 plus generations, I, I, I believe. It's, it's, it's kind of of that order of magnitude, um, order sort of, um, around about figures. Now, this kind of means that less people statistically are going to turn up who are more, more primarily going to be people who want to stay in the EU. I think it's important for young people to turn up on a bias point of view because I want to stay in the EU and I think that's generally like where we're going to get people to vote for people who you know want to be part of something bigger and better and something that you know kind of knocks down the barriers a bit which is you know this is an ideological defense of the EU but moving on to a more sort of like um, pragmatic idea I think it's just because you know, young people young people need to start turning up to vote because they're going to be growing up in a scenario that's being dictated by people who might not, you know, people who might not be participating in the society in the same way in 20 years' time. Whereas the people in our age bracket in 20 years' time will be in the, you know, some of us be in the peak of our careers, some of us will be up and coming, will basically be people who are the main producers of society. So we want to have a world in where we're making an active voice into that. Like we, we, we I, I want my generation to vote the way they want to see the world be for them, because they have that interest in the world. You know, they're growing up into this world. They'll be our next leaders. They'll be our next you know, CEOs. We, we, we want these people to mould or, or basically you know, shape what society they want and not just have that view from an older generation. You want a balanced idea. You want, a, you want equal platforms that people get to decide what they want, but we don't get that. And our generation suffers because we can foresee problems that maybe other generations can't because we're the ones experiencing like high rents and high mortgages and uh, high tuition fees or lack of jobs or just general sort of <laughs> depressing states of uh, how we look at things. I think we need to turn up to actually get that story told. This is how we do the world and this is going to be a problem. That's just a general case. In the EU, I think it's the same thing applies. You know, they've, even if they're if they're for or against staying in, they need to turn up above seventy percent to actually show that, like, actually just present a world in where it's more molded by, for them because they've turned up to vote. It's difficult though to get people to turn up is difficult, but I think it's crucially important that they do.